Today's video is going to be the start of hopefully like a mini series of occasional videos on this topic every so often, where I look at some more smart home stuff. But as you can tell by a few interesting devices on this table, I'm not going about this the normal way. When it comes to smart home stuff, I'm really interested in it, but I'm also quite opinionated. And it's probably quite controversial. But I really don't like the current attitude of a lot of modern smart home equipment, where it all requires cloud accounts and linking devices to your manufacturer's online account and your devices all talking out to the internet and doing all that sort of stuff. And really getting the manufacturer really closely tied in with your devices so that they have a lot of control and they can deprecate devices in the future or change features or stop it working with an integration that used to work. Now, while for the vast majority of people that is an absolutely fine solution, and most people aren't going to want to run servers and build their own software like I would do, but for me, I want to have full control over my stuff. A couple of years ago, I built my own smart central heating control system using a Sonoff smart switch running custom firmware that I wrote, and then custom software that I wrote running on my server. I made a video of that so that I'll put a card up if, card up if people haven't seen that. And I am so happy with it, it's worked brilliantly for the last two and, two and a bit of years, and it's so, I just really love having that, having full control over it all and not relying on any other organisation or manufacturer to keep my heating running. For a while now, I've also wanted to get into some sort of smart lighting system, just because I want a bit more, you know, stylized light lighting, being able to dim individual bulbs or have different coloured lights in different zones, just to have a bit more, more atmosphere and just a nice environment to really sit in and live in. I looked into building this into my existing system, which is custom Python software I wrote, and it would be very much possible, but obviously that's a lot of work. However, I recently tried out software called Node Red, and I absolutely love it. We'll take a look at the actual software later, but essentially it's just it's smart home sort of home automation system software that you can run on a server and almost do make drag and drop flows of data of data and control signals to say, right, this I have this input coming from this switch, I want to make a decision based on the input, and I want to then send a signal to these bulbs to switch them on. We'll take a look at the software later. But this is software that I can run on my own server and fully automate my smart home system locally using all this locally hosted software. And I really like it. So I want to now use that to build my lighting system. And in the future, I might move other things like my heating over to it. So today, we're going to be taking a look at the first phase of the lighting upgrade, where I've got a bunch of hardware here we'll be using to make some my own smart lighting system running on Node Red. Now, this is going to be the first video where we just start setting everything up. So we'll take a look at a selection of some smart bulbs I've bought here. These are just the ones I'm going to be starting with. I'm going to be buying many more over the coming months, I presume, will be the period of time. But this will just be what we'll be starting out with. So the main focus of this video, though, is to get all of this hardware set up. So I'm going to show how I'm going to be connecting all these bulbs to Node Red. I'll then show all the hardware as well, set it all up, show the configuration within Node Red, and then show it all working. And hopefully it all works. And in theory, at the end, I'll end up with my own full smart lighting system but fully locally controlled and I've got full control over all the hardware and software involved. So let's jump in here and take a look at what we'll be using. So first of all, let's take a look at the bulbs I went for. And in buying the bulbs, I had to make a decision as to what technology I wanted to go for. With smart bulbs, there's a bunch of different systems you can get around how they communicate. So we'll go through them. You've got Wi-Fi bulbs, Zigbee bulbs, Z-Wave bulbs. Then you've also got IR, Bluetooth, and RF remote control bulbs. And they all kind of cater for different markets and work in slightly different ways. The first ones we'll take a look at are the, are the ones that we'll just rule out immediately. So IR and RF remote control bulbs aren't really smart bulbs in, in that sense. You can't really connect them to a computer or different software or anything like that. They're just remote controlled bulbs. They're ideal if you just want a single bulb and you want to just control it with a remote control and you'll have a remote control that's either infrared or RF based. But in order to make that smart controlled, you'd be having to reverse engineer infrared or radio protocols, and that's just not worth the effort. So I ruled all those out. Z-Wave bulbs, I didn't go for that just because it's not that common. Z-Wave's quite popular for things like sensors and switches and stuff like that, but it's not very popular for things like actual light bulbs. So I didn't go for that. Bluetooth, it also just isn't really suitable. Bluetooth is designed if you want a bulb that you connect to your phone directly and just control it with an app. It's not really designed for the sort of long distance distances I have, in, I have here, nor is it designed for the number of devices that I have. So that left me with Wi-Fi or Zigbee. Now, if you look on places like Amazon, the vast majority of bulbs you'll see will be Wi-Fi based. 
These are very easy to get started with for people because you just buy the bulb, put it in, download an app on their phone, turn the bulb on, add the bulb to the app, connect it all up and it connects it and works straight away. You also don't need a hub and that's something that you'll see a lot when you're seeing these bulbs on Amazon. If they mention no hub required, that means that they tend to be Wi-Fi bulbs. Now, the vast majority of those Wi-Fi bulbs use a platform called Tuya. Tuya, I think, is a Chinese company and they basically make this white label smart home device software platform. So what companies can do is they can produce these really cheap smart bulbs and use this pre-existing platform with a pre-existing app and you can add your bulbs to it. But I really didn't want to go down that route. It's kind of everything I don't like in smart home in the sense that you have to then put your bulb in, your bulb then has to connect over the internet to an external API that you have no control over and then all your communication with your bulb goes through the internet most of the time. These bulbs do have a local API, but in order to even get the API keys to access that, you need to register it with a Tuya cloud system, register as a developer, and then you can log into your developer account and get the API key and then control it locally over the network. But for me, even though I'd be able to do that and then the bulbs would work totally offline, I still don't like the idea of still even having to set it up by involving a third party's cloud service. So that ruled those out. There's also some other type, some other Wi-Fi bulbs that might be better, like LiFX. They seem to allow you to have a local sort of local control without needing to do any sort of weird developer account stuff to get API keys. But there's just not as wide a selection. There also isn't a wide selection of Wi-Fi wall switches and stuff like that. And then just having that many devices on my Wi-Fi network just didn't really sit right with me. I mean, I've got a very good Wi-Fi network that can handle hundreds of clients, but still having you know twelve plus. Divide Wi-Fi clients in my living room alone just to do the lighting didn't really feel right. And additionally, I'm probably quite old fashioned or paranoid and I really don't like having smart bulbs switched on permanently. So even though I'll be using these for color changing, I'll still be turning them off at the switches when I'm not using them. And with Wi-Fi bulbs, I didn't really like that idea because I could be going in turning a light switch on and instantly having nine Wi-Fi clients trying to connect to the network all at once. And I just felt that would be a bit slow and take a while to connect up. So therefore, I've gone for Zigbee bulbs. Zigbee is a 2.4 GHz wireless protocol. It's not Wi-Fi or Bluetooth, it's separate, but it works on 2.4 GHz. And it's this, it's a mesh wireless technology designed for smart devices like this. It's actually the same technology used by Philips Hue, IKEA smart bulbs, and a large, basically almost the vast majority of smart bulbs that use an external hub. That means there's a huge selection of bulbs, there's a huge selection of switches, and it's just a really nice open protocol. So that's what we'll be using. So these are all Zigbee bulbs. And the cool thing is that we can get them from all different manufacturers. So here we've got a Philips Hue bulb. We've got a bulb from Leadvans, which is the new name for Osram, I think. I think Osram was bought out. And then these are a company called Muller Licks, which is a German company. And I can make these all work with my system. So before I reveal how I'm going to connect this all up to Node-RED, we'll take a look at all the hardware we've gone for for the bulbs. So what I needed is I needed one Edison screw bulb, three small Edison screw bulbs, one for the living room and two for the bedroom that I'll be doing late, at a later date, but I thought I'll buy all the bulbs at once. And then I just wanted something a bit more decorative for one corner. So I've gone for this Philips Hue Bloom. So to satisfy the more boring requirements first, we needed the small Edison screw ones, so I went for these. These are a company called Muller Licht, which is a German company. It also sounds very much like Muller Light Yogurt, but anyway. So I had to actually import these from Germany, but I just bought them from Amazon, so they came directly through Prime in a couple of days. And these seem to be the best value small Edison screw or E14 RGB smart bulbs I could find. There was like one or two others that were easily available in the UK, but one of them was really expensive and the other one was only like 200 lumen output, which wouldn't be enough. So I've gone for these. These are 470 lumens apparently, although that will vary based on the colour temperature and the colour you've picked. They're configurable colour temperature between 1800 Kelvin and 6500 Kelvin, which is a huge range, and they're RGB. So these are full RGB colour and also RGBW, so you can have proper accurate whites out of them with configurable colour temperature. And as you can see there, they're, they're Zigbee. So most Zigbee devices do say on the, the, on the prop box that they're Zigbee based. But you do need to be careful because if you're on Amazon and you search for Zigbee bulb, half of the listings will be Wi-Fi bulbs that Amazon just shows you for some reason. So you've got to be really careful and make sure, make sure you are buying a Zigbee bulb, not, a, not one of those Wi-Fi ones. 
things to look for are things like if it says no hub required, it's probably a Wi-Fi bulb, or if it comes bundled with a remote control, just be careful to make sure the bulb is Zigbee and it's not a generic 2.4 gigahertz RF bulb. But yeah, this is a Zigbee bulb. Take a look at the bulb, it's gonna be very basic. It's a light bulb. Um, but yeah, that's it there. It's just a small instant screw candle bulb and that should be full RGBW. So we've got three of those there. The next one is again, a very boring bulb. Can't believe I'm now reviewing light bulbs, but anyway, again, Zigbee. This is a company called LED Vance or LED Vance, which I was a bit dubious about because I'd never heard of them. But then I looked it up and it turns out Osram, like the, the big company that make light bulbs, there was some acquisition somewhere and part of the company got sold off to a different company and that's now LED Vance. So it's essentially Osram. I think these used to be sold under the Osram brand. This is a very similar bulb to the other ones. It's just very similar design. It's in screw fitting. And then if you look at the specs, if it says, yep, there we go. 2700 Kelvin, 6500 Kelvin. So it doesn't go as warm, but it should still be fine. It's nine watts, 806 lumen output. That's really bright. And it's yeah, full RGBW again, so that should be fine. And then I quite like where it's like, it says, oh, you need to buy our gateway, like our little hub and use our app. I'm like, ha, huh, nope, not gonna be using that, but this should be fully compatible. Then for the final light I've gone for is a Philips Hue one, because this whole system is Hue compatible. The Hue bulbs are just very expensive, so I didn't go for them for everything else because there are cheaper options out there. But I wanted something in the corner of the living room that wasn't another freestanding lamp. So I bought this Hue Bloom, which I think looks really nice and actually just shine a nice like glow up on, onto the wall. I've bought one of these for now because I know for a fact this will work brilliantly in one corner of my bedroom and I'm not sure how well it'll work, it'll work in the living room. So I've bought one to try in the living room. If I don't like it, I'll put it through in the bedroom. And if I do like it, I'll buy another one for the bedroom. Now, this was quite expensive. So this was 69.99. So this was quite a pricey device, but it should be really good. And then for pricing on the other ones, actually, because I forgot to mention that, these Muller Licht tint ones, these were 21.75 a bulb. And the LED Vance Edson screw one was 21 pounds. So they're not super cheap, but they, they're not deadly expensive. They're definitely a bit cheaper than like the Hue bulbs. But yep, there's the Hue Bloom. And it's just a little sort of thing like that that can sit like that. And the idea is generally that you'd point it away from you at a wall and make it reflect off the wall, which will be quite nice. And then it's got a power brick in here. And then different country plugs. And then you can just clip that on there and plug it into the wall. So that'll be a nice little fitting there. So there we go. That's a look at all the lights I've gone for. The Philips Hue Bloom at 69.99. The Muller Licht RGBW Small Edison Screw E14 at 21.75. And the LED Vans Edison Screw E27 RGBW bulb for 21 pounds. So that's all the bulbs I've gone for there. What I'll now do is clear all this stuff out of the way and look at the more interesting stuff which is how we're going to bridge all these devices to Node-RED running on my server. So now here's how we're going to connect all this up to Node-RED. Because obviously those are Zigbee bulbs, so they work over the Zigbee protocol, but Node-RED software are running on a server. So we need a way to bridge the two. Normally with these sorts of bulbs you buy a hub. So you can buy your Hue bridge or a bulb or just any hub that works with these sorts of lights. And each of the manufacturers I've looked at for these bulbs sells their own hub. And they're somewhat interoperable. I think some of the bulbs can work with Hue and things like that. And you plug the hub into your network, connect it to the manufacturer's app. It cannot, it can connect out to the internet if you want for like optional cloud control, although thankfully on some of those devices it is optional and that's how you would use it. But those don't really connect to Node-RED particularly well. Some of them can have local APIs, but it's not really what I'm going for here. I'm going to do something totally custom. And for that, I'm going to use some software called Zigbee to MQTT. This is a Node.js based application that someone's built and it's really cool. You can use a simple Zigbee USB stick like this, plug it into a computer, run the software, and it will bridge the Zigbee protocol over to MQTT. Now MQTT is a message bus protocol. Essentially, it's software you can run on a server, you can connect multiple devices to it, and those devices can send messages to the server or listen to messages from the server. And these messages are filtered into what's called topics. So you can have an MQTT topic for each bulb, you can then publish a message to that topic and control the bulb. And that's what we'll be doing here. 
Node Red is also heavily based around MQTT. It's one of the main ways of communicating with it. You run your MQTT server, you connect Node Red to it, and then Node Red can receive messages over MQTT and output them again. I also use MQTT for my own existing heating stuff as well, so I'm very familiar with it. Now you can run that on really any computer. I've tried it out briefly on a laptop and it all works fine. But obviously I'm just going to use a Raspberry Pi because why not? It's basically what everyone uses. So I'll be building up a little Zigbee to MQTT bridge device using a Raspberry Pi. And while I could also run Node Red and everything on the Pi, my plan is to keep it all a bit separate. So I'll run Node Red on my server because it's a nice powerful server that's already up and running and works really well. And I'll be building almost like the most appliance-like bridge I can. So I won't be treating this like a Raspberry Pi running like a server that I'm going to be logging into regularly and changing. I want a totally set and forget solution so I can build this up, plug it in, and never need to really go in and, go in and maintain, maintain or configure the software again. So let's take a look at what we're using. For the most simple stuff, we've just got the Pi itself. This is something people have probably seen before. So I've gone for a Pi 3 Model B Plus. So this is like the newer Pi 3. I didn't really need a Pi 4, that would just be over the top. This doesn't really need much power. But it is a Node.js based application, so it's probably a little bit heavy. So I wanted the 3 Plus just because it's nice, nice and powerful. It's got like a quad-core processor and like a gig of RAM, but it should be more than enough. So that's there, just a standard Raspberry Pi. Most people probably have hundreds of these lying around, but I don't. I've only got a couple of original Model, model Bs and they're not going to be powerful enough, so that's it there. And the good thing with the 3B+, Plus, the new model, or it's not the newest, but this particular model and the ones afterwards, is that they have PoE compatibility. So I've bought the official PoE hat, Power Over Ethernet, and what I can do is I can simply place that hat on the Pi like that, and then if I plug this into a power, power over Ethernet source on my network, it will power the Pi. And this will be really good, because my plan for this is that I, is I need this somewhere fairly centrally in my flat, because Zigbee isn't the most powerful protocol, so I don't want to shove this away in a cupboard somewhere. So I want to put this in my hallway. Now in my hallway I do have a couple of Ethernet ports, so I can plug it straight into that, but the nearest wall socket's a bit further away and I don't want to be trailing cables, so I can actually use this and power it over PoE, so that'll be really cool. So we've got that PoE hat there, so nice PoE powered Pi there. Then going for this case here, there's nothing particularly fancy at all, I think this was RS Components I got this from, but it's just a nice sort of metal Raspberry Pi case, so it should be fairly nice and durable. I wanted something that looked a bit more industrial, and this was fairly cheap, so that's the case I've gone for there. And then finally we've got the world's cheapest SD card, micro SD card, 16 gig Keoxia one, and this was literally three pounds from Amazon, or three pounds 10, I think. So that'll do. What I'll be doing with this, I'll talk about the software setup later, but I'll be building this in such a way that it all runs from RAM. So the SD card performance won't really matter. And I won't really be writing much to this SD card. I'll write a little bit for some configuration, but that's it. So I don't need to worry too much about getting a particularly fast or high end SD card for this. Now over here, we've got all the hardware for Zigbee. The key component of this is this USB stick here, which also comes with a little aerial. These are quite widely available, and these are Zigbee USB, USB adapters. This particular one uses the Texas Instruments CC2531 chip. The Zigbee to MQTT website does list a bunch of chipsets that are compatible with this. This is one of the lower end cheaper ones, but it'll hopefully do the job fine. There are a few higher end models you can get. These aren't too expensive. You can pick these up for five to 15 pounds, depending on what you go for. You pay a little bit more if you want, want, want one with an external aerial, but I decided to go for that. The cheaper ones just have a trace on the PCB. And that's the adapter we're gonna use there. You can also get these things even cheaper if you bought it from overseas, but I paid a little bit more to get it from the UK just because it was easier. But yeah, that's the stick there. But with these sticks, you're essentially just getting a bit of hardware without really any firmware on it. This one did come with some firmware of some description on it, but when you plug it in, it shows up as a device, but it's not, I don't quite know what firmware it runs. It's just a very generic device. So with Zigbee to MQTT, they provide firmware you're to run on your particular stick. Now you can buy these sticks pre-flashed with Zigbee to MQTT firmware. So you can look on eBay and for eBay and other online market marketplaces for devices like that. And that should work out of the box. But for me, I've decided I want to program this myself just because I want the flexibility because there's a few different versions of the firmware and I wanted to be able to definitely pick what version I want and change it or update it if there's issues and not rely on whatever version someone else has flashed. So for that, we need to program this. 
Unfortunately, you can't actually program these over USB. You need an external debugger to hook up to this particular header here and flash the firmware on. So that's what this is here. These are referred to as CC debuggers because of the CC2531 chip and they work with other chips from that line as well. These are pretty cheap. This, this one I think costs about was it £12, something like that. But you can buy these really cheap if you get them from overseas. You can get them for a fiver. And literally all you do is plug it into USB there and plug your, don't, your USB adapter into here. And you can run the official Texas Instruments software, which is available from their website. You, you need to sign up as a developer, but you can just do that and download the software for free. Or there's other software for Linux you can run. And you can write the firmware image from the Zigbee MQTT website onto your stick. And then the only other thing we needed is you can see that's also got quite a large pin pitch connector and that's a tiny little header there. So all you need is just this little adapter board here which I think costs two, three pounds, something like that. And just give you a pin header that you can plug onto that board there and a larger header that you can then connect into the, your CC debugger. And that was a very simple process. I won't demonstrate that whole thing on the video because this really isn't a tutorial. It's more me showing what I'm doing and explaining it roughly. But if you wanted to do this yourself, there's plenty of information online on how to do all this. But all you need to do is use that debugger there to flash the Zigbee TMQTT firmware onto your stick. This will then show up as a serial device under Linux. And then you can run the Zigbee TMQTT software, which will connect to the stick and bridge out to your MQTT broker. So there we go. That's look at all the hardware we're going to be using to make my own Zigbee to MQTT bridge. So what we'll do now is we'll assemble all this, get the software installed and set up, and then try it out and see if we can connect these bulbs. So now let's really quickly assemble the Pi. Obviously it's not the main point of this video to show that, but I may as well. So I've got the case and I've got the PoE hat, but I didn't really think and didn't check the case was designed for the PoE hat, but it will work. The mounting is just going to be a little bit fiddly. So the PoE hat came with these, all these screws and these little standoff things. And I think what you're meant to do is put the standoffs on, like on your Pi, put your PoE hat on top and screw into them. And then obviously screw from the bottom of your pie up into the little nut as well. However, this particular case also needs screws to go through the top of the case, through the pie and into the bottom of the case to mount the case shut. And it comes with these standoffs. I think you're meant to then screw into the corner of your pie and then you still have your, have your pie under here. That goes through it and then you screw into the top. So I won't be able to use all of these to mount it. So what I think I'm going to do is I'm going to put the pie in and then I'm going to secure it down with two of these screws in two corners and then put the two longer screws through the top of the case to secure it in. And that should be good enough to secure the PoE hat on. It won't necessarily be ideal, but I mean, I'm not exactly going to be throwing this around. It will <laughs> sit fairly static in my hallway behind the cabinet, so that should be okay. So, i stay that on there. First time playing with these, one of these new pies, and it seems really nice. And the PoE hat seems really cool as well. It's got a little fan on it as well that apparently is software controllable, so that should be fine if I can control it if it's too loud. And that'll help cool the CPU. So put those two screws in there. Shit, that one's tight enough. Yeah. And then if we slot the PoE hat on there, like that. What I'm then going to do is if you push that on too far, it, the transformer starts pressing off the PCB. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to use these standoffs and I'm going to put one in this corner here. I'm basically going to put these in the corners of, of the pie that, are, that I'm going to screw through the top of the case into. And the plan with this is this will just help it space out. It'll stop the PoE hat sinking down too low and touching the PCB. So again, this is probably not the official way of doing it. This is a bit of a bodge, but it's the best way I can really see it working with the hardware I've got here. So that's now in there. We can see we've got those little standoffs under there. Yeah, definitely not the correct way of doing it, but it'll work. And if we can just clip the top of the case over, we can then hopefully put those remaining two screws through. So that'll go in there. I think you can get cases designed for the PoE hat, so they might be better, but this'll do for now. And then I can hopefully screw through the top of the case, which will then screw into that sort of nut thing. And then it'll screw down into the case and keep it shut. So just do up these screws. And we should be good to go. And there we go. So that's now the pie installed. And the PoE hat is perfectly fitted. So that's all built there. 
now we need to do is pop the SD card in. So I can go in there. And that is a pretty nice little solution. So that's dead neat. Seems pretty good. And then all we need to do is plug that USB stick in. Now, obviously that's not a bare PCB. You can buy these with cases, but they're quite a bit more expensive. And I think you can also buy cases for them, but I think I'll just put a bit of heat shrink around that and that'll probably do the job. I'm not exactly gonna have this somewhere it's gonna get hit really, so it should be fine. So that's all set up. So what I'll now do is I'll go away and get all the software installed on this, get it set up, and I'll come back and show it working, talk about how to set the software up, and then we'll try it out. So I'm now back with all the software installed. So we've got the Pi here, and we've got the USB stick. Because I don't have a case for it, I've just protected this by putting heat shrink around it, so I've just put a bit of heat shrink over it and just shrunk that down, and that fits fine. Not the neatest thing, well, not the most attractive thing ever, but it's fine, cheaper than the case, and that'll protect it a little bit. And that can just plug into any of the USB ports. And now the software is all set up, I can plug this in and it'll work. So we can just plug it into a PoE network port, chuck that in there. The fan twitches and it makes a bit coil whine just when it's first powering on, but that stops. And if we look around the back, we can see we've got the power LED. And next to that, we've got the disk activity LED and you can see that's flashing, so that's it booting up. So that's it starting up there. Now, as for the software side, I'm not obviously going to show the whole setup process, but with this, I've decided to go for Alpine Linux. Alpine is a distro that I find is really ideal for this sort of thing because by default it runs from RAM. So you have a persistent image on your SD card and when you turn it on it boots into RAM and runs out of that. That then means when you power the Pi off or restart it, any changes made are lost. That's really good for a device like this because it means that it can run for years or months at a time and if there's ever an issue or any corruption or anything like that, I can power cycle it and it'll boot from a known clean image. It also means I don't need to worry about hard powering it down, I can just kill the power to it and unplug it easily because there's no running file system that can be corrupted because as soon as the power is lost it goes back to that known good image. There's also obviously a command that if you're first setting up there's a command that will write the RAM disk back to the SD card. So you can set it up, you, you set it all up, run that command, it writes it back and then that will be persistent across reboots. But it means a standard run when it's just running like this. If I were to power cycle this, it'll boot back up to a known good image. Installing ZigBee to MQTT was really simple. I just followed the instructions on their website and just slightly tweaked it for Alpine because I think their instructions were for Debian. But it was still dead, dead easy to set up, worked absolutely fine. And then with Alpine, because it's got that file system that's in RAM, you can also mount certain directories to be running directly off the SD card so they're persistent. With ZigBee to MQTT, there's a single data directory and that holds the config and a, a couple of database files around the state of the system and around what devices are enrolled. What I've then done is I've set that up so that that single directory is mounted directly off the SD card. So almost like it's an appliance, any changes made to the ZigBee to MQTT software itself around configuration will be saved, but any changes to the rest of the operating system will reset every time the device is rebooted. And that was really slick. Apart from that, that there wasn't really much else to really speak of in the setup, just a couple of little tweaks if anyone else was trying to set this up, was that when I first set it up, the USB port, that this, the serial port that this stick appears as was owned by root and had a group of root. And that then meant that because I'm running ZigBee to MQTT as a less privileged user, it couldn't access the serial port. To fix that, all I needed to do was install UDEV and set it so the server runs on boot. And that alone fixed it. It just meant that this serial port is now owned by the dialout group. And that then meant that I could add my ZigBee to MQTT user to the, to the dialout group. And that then worked. I've also installed Nginx as a web server because ZigBee to MQTT by default has an optional web interface you can switch on. So it's a single option in the command in the configuration file and that gives you a nice web interface that we'll take a look at to manage all the devices and pair new ones and also to get logs out. And it means I can now use this without a single, without ever SSHing in or changing any files again. I can do it fully through that web UI. That runs on port 8080 or some port that you can pick. So all I've done is I've just put Nginx on this as a reverse proxy, just so I can run that on port 80 because it's a bit easier. I don't need to remember a port number to connect to it. But yeah, that's all I really needed to do for the setup. The only other thing I found was just the fan. By default, the fan curve is just really annoying because it was set to around about 50 degrees that the fan would first turn on and then the fan would ramp up at just over 50 degrees. And the problem is for me that in this sort of environment, the fan, the CPU sits around about 53, 55 degrees. 
which is totally safe. I mean, these CPUs are happy up to 80 degrees, but the problem was that it would sit there, it would creep up, the fan would kick on, then the fan would ramp up to full speed, cool the CPU down really quickly, and then the fan would turn off again. And it would do this literally once every minute. The fan would sort of turn on for 10 seconds at a low speed, run at full speed, which was really loud for about 20 seconds, and then turn off for 30 seconds again. And then 30 seconds later, it would turn on again and start doing it over and over again. And I could just constantly hear this ramping up and down. So all I needed to do is you've got the config.txt file on the SD card, which is standard for a Pi. It's almost like the equivalent of a BIOS almost. There's some config you can put in there, although on Alpine, I think there's like a separate file, userconfig.txt you're meant to use. And there's just a bunch of config lines you put in there. They're widely available on the internet. And it just lets you set the fan curve so you can see at what temperature the fan is to come on at what speed. So I've set it up now that the fan comes on around about 60 degrees, which should never really happen in normal, in normal use. So that the fan's off most of the time, but if for some reason there was really high CPU load on this, the fan could then come on and cool it down and keep it safe. So yeah, the setup was pretty easy. I'm definitely very happy with Alpine. It works really well for this, just because I have I have no fears about it losing power or becoming corrupted. And also it really reduces the writes on the SD card. Because now that, yes, Zigbee to MQTT will write to the SD card for its configuration changes and its database, but there's now no longer any operating system logs stored on that SD card. So it should hopefully last a long time as well. But yeah, that's all booted up now. See, it's got a network link on, on it down there. So the light's very faint, but there's a there's network activity. So that's up and running, and it will have actually gone and connected to my MQTT broker already. So let's go over to a computer and take a look at the web interface. Okay, so I've got all the lights out here with all the bulbs installed. So I've got my two bedroom lamps here with the E14 ones installed. I've got a living room lamp here with another E14 installed, the Hue Bloom, and then a living room lamp with the E27 installed, which, yep, yeah, that's a floor standing lamp that's precariously balanced across a bunch of stuff on its side to keep it on the table to get it in view, but yep, yeah, that works there. So let's try this out. So first of all, by default, if we turn these bulbs on, what you'll see is they come onto this RGB strobe thing and then go onto white. And you'll notice that they all do that. And they all do that every time you turn them on when they're not paired over Zigbee. So if I were to turn one of these off, wait a few seconds and turn it on again, it'll do that. And that's a sign that it's not yet been paired. So it's ready to pair to Zigbee hub, in this case, Zigbee to MQTT. The Hue Bloom doesn't really do that. It just sort of comes on at a warm white by default when it's not connected at all. But yeah, that's the behavior of, they're a bit different. But it's also interesting seeing these bulbs from different manufacturers that are behaving really similarly. So I suspect these have a very similar or very common chipset in them or common firmware, but yeah, that's how they work. So now let's check out the software. So we'll turn all these lights off just so they're not all on ready when we're about to do it. But now let's go over to the laptop and take a look at Zigbee to MQTT. So we can just load it up by just going to the IP address of the Raspberry Pi. Ideally not Googling it, there we go. And here's Zigbee to MQTT. So this is the web interface. Obviously there's nothing installed here, so, but it's quite a nice web interface. You can have all your devices listed here. I think there's like a dashboard that lets you like view the colors of individual devices and stuff. And you can do very basic controls from this as well as logging so you can view all the logs. But first of all, let's try and pair a bulb. So up here you can see there's this thing that says permit to join all. In the config file, you can specify whether it's going to let you join new devices or not. And you'd normally want to leave that off and only switch it on when you want to pair a device, just so you, other people can't pair your devices or your neighbour through the wall from you won't be buying smart bulbs and having it pair to your hub, hub by mistake. What I've done here is I've left that switched off in the config file and then through the web interface you can just press this button and it will enable the pairing for a period of time or until you switch it off again. So we press that and it will say Zigbee allowing new devices to join. And now let's try turning a light on. So we turn this bulb on here. It flashes like that and it comes on. But now if I was to refresh this page, it might take a little minute to come up. There we go, the light's now flashed. Yeah, flashed a few times and now, hopefully, it should start showing up here. There we go. So it took a little second there. I think it does a sort of in, a process that calls an interview. So that obviously takes a little second, but that's now there and we can see the bulbs are showing up. We can then go into like the information about here. It shows all the information, shows it's a LED vans. There's a model, all the information about it. 
there's a more sort of internal model number. And these models are all listed on the Zigbee to MQTT website, so you can see all the particularly supported bulbs, and there's a lot that are. You can also create custom, you can also add support for your own bulbs fairly easily if you needed to. It then gives you this control here, so you can either go into this interface here, or you can go into the dashboard and get control over the bulb. And this gives you basic control from this web interface. So for example here, if I were to turn the bulb off, it'll fade out and turn off. Or turn it on again, it'll turn on. We can also adjust the brightness using this slider here, like that, you see it's brighter or it's darker. Change the colour temperature from a very cool white to a very warm white. And we can also even change the colour, so we can go into here, pick a different colour, and the bulb will switch to that colour. So that is working. Now obviously this isn't very exciting because this is just running purely from the Zigbee to MQTT web interface, but it shows that we are now able to control a bulb. What you can also do in here is you can also rename it, so I can give it a more friendly name like Living Room or LR Rear Lamp, just because that's the lamp at the back of the living room. Save changes. And that's the name that you'll use over, Zigbee, Zigbee, over the MQTT protocol, so you can give all your devices names to make it easier. So now let's pair the rest of them. So we'll turn this one on here. That one paired a lot quicker, so it's now showing up there, and that's it now in. So I'm going to name this. And the trick is if you do them all one by one, it means that you, you know which bulb switch. So I'll just do bedroom lamp right. Save. Turn the next one on. That one comes on, there it is. Rename that. There we go. Turn on this other lamp, turn that on. That one pairs, shows up here. Rename that LR front lamp. And now finally, can we get the Philips Hue 1 to pair? So we'll plug that in, it comes on, and there we go, it's paired up. So, yep, works with Philips Hue as well, so that's it there. Give it a name again, LR Hue Bloom. And there we go, so now that is all of our bulbs showing up in Zigbee to MQTT. And obviously we've already tried one of them, but we can try it with all of these, so we can go into this one here, or we'll just go to the dashboard, let's try changing that light to blue. There we go. Then we'll change the hue bloom to a different colour again. The hue bloom isn't really showing up on camera, but if I turn it around actually, that shows up a lot clearer. Obviously, bear in mind these lights are under fairly bright studio lights, so they won't be as bright here as they are in real life, but yep, that's working. I can go through and turn them all off as well. There we go. So that's working. So what we now have is all of these bulbs are now paired to Zigbee to MQTT and I can control them from the web interface. And what that means is this is now all automatically working over MQTT. So let's take a look at that. So now here we have MQTT Explorer. This is just some free software that can connect an MQTT broker and let you use it manually. Like it, you don't have to have additional software controlling MQTT. You don't have to deal with Node-RED right now. We can just manually issue commands. So here we can see it's already showing up. We can see we have Zigbee to MQTT showing up as one of the topics. There's the bridge. And this just shows information about the bridge, saying it's online, what devices are connected, all that sort of stuff. But in theory, we can now issue a command to turn on a bulb. So the topic here is that, but if we change that, we can change the next part of the topic will be the name of the bulb. So in this case, I'll try and turn on, say, bedroom lamp left. So we can type that in here. Room lamp left, forward slash set, and then you just provide some JSON, so state on. And if we publish that to that topic, that bulb comes on. We can also change things like the colour, so for example I can go temp, or colour temp think, and if we set this to a number between 100 and 500, we do 100, it goes cold, and we change it to 500, it goes warm. 
And then of course, if we change that bulb to different ones, we've done bedroom lamp left, let's try LR hue balloon. And then we'll try and set and know the color to a hex code of FF0000 for red. Oh, and it also needs to turn it on, oops. On. That comes on, and then we can change the color to red. So there you go. That was a quick demo of MQTT Explorer. We've got all the lights connected to Zigbee to MQTT. They're now exposed over it. We can publish the topics and change the bulbs. And it's really flexible. So that was a quick demo showing the brightness, color temperature, turning them on and off, stuff like that. You can also chain multiple commands together. For example, you could tell to change the brightness and the color temperature at the same time. And you can even do transitions. So for example, we tried changing that, the hue bloom to red. We can see right now we want to change it to blue. But rather than change instantly, I don't want it to now change and just jump to blue. I can provide a transition value and then a number of seconds. So I can say five seconds, publish that. And over the course of five seconds, the hue bloom will slowly change from red to blue. And it's a really cool effect. So that's it all set up there. What I'll now do is I'll jump into Node Red, build some flows, and then come back and show them working. Because ultimately, the best way to control these will be using Node Red, not using manual MQTT Explorer stuff or the Zigbee to MQTT web interface. So I'll go away and set that up, and I'll come back and show it. Okay, so I'm now back, and I've got Node Red all set up. So what you can see here is what the lights as before. And just to give a sort of rough concept and let me do some scenes, I divided them into three columns. So you've got the left column with these two, the middle column with these two, and the right column is just this one on its own. Obviously this will change, this won't be a permanent system because these lights are going to be in different rooms from each other and I'll have different flows and different dashboards for each of them. But this will do as a good example and I'll base the stuff I actually built off of this. So here for example we can now see a completed dashboard. And this is a really cool thing with Node Red is it lets you build these dashboards with form controls on them that you can interact with. And as you can see, given the aspect ratio of it, it's very much designed for mobile use and it works really well on a phone. So what I've got here is a bunch of controls. So we've got the on-off, main on-off, so we press that to turn them on. All the lights will come on. I've then got a slider here for colour temperature. So we can slide that from much warmer temperature up to much cooler temperature. There's also our brightness controls. So we can go down to global brightness and we can slide that down, make everything darker or make everything brighter. As I mentioned, I've got those columns, so I can, for, for example, change the brightness of these columns individually from each other, like that. So we can have the left and right darker and the middle one brighter. And then if I was to say darken the right column down and then adjust the global brightness, it will also, it will work as like a multiplier. So it'll work at 16% of the other ones in terms of brightness. So that works really well. Likewise for colors, we can also change the colors of all the bulbs like that. They don't all match each other perfectly because they're different different manufacturers and different lights, but I could obviously build some sort of offsets into the code and that would work fine. I've then created different brightness scenes and color scenes. So for example, I can go change the color scene from all, where they'll all match each other, to colored ends, for example, which will make the middle column white and that, that will work off the color temperature and then the ends will work off of the color that's selected, like that. I've also got checkerboard, where what it will do is it will mix them up and it'll have this color here as one of the colors. And then there's a secondary color here that I can change. So I can have individual lights colored differently. This is just a very quick example. It's not absolutely finished yet, but I'll probably be basing the whole solution off of something like this. Similarly, there's brightness scenes. For example, I can say fade to right, which will make them get darker progressively as it gets closer to the right. I'll make it white because it'll be easier to probably see on camera. Or I can change it to single left column, which will set the brightness on the two right columns to nothing. So you only left columns on. So that's the dashboard built. Now the key thing is, how is this built? Because I've just shown it working so you can get an idea of what I've done. But now let's take a look at the flow in Node Red. So here's Node Red and here's a flow. And all of this is individual blocks connected together. For example, each of those form controls, such as brightness seen on off, these are all the individual controls you're seeing on the dashboard. For example, you've got temperature, K, which is in Kelvin, and that is this control here. These then output values, which get passed into these functions, which are bits of JavaScript, and these take that and they store it. So they look at the um, values coming in and they store it in a JavaScript array that's global to the function and can be accessed by other functions. 
is global to the flow and can be accessed by other functions. I'm not going to go into a huge amount of detail of how Node-RED works because it's pretty complicated and there's going to be people out there that know it better than me. But then you can see that we then come through here, we then pass these values, we've got these nodes here that look at the current scenes that are selected for brightness and colour based on these particular dropdowns here. And depending on what one is selected, it will then split out and send the, the control signals such as the brightness message or whatever to a different function that then passes out to more and it all just passes through. It's, I'm not going to go into too much detail on all this, but this is essentially what you've got. It passes all the data through, splits it out into different groups. And then the more interesting thing is when we get to the right, we can see we've got these groups here. And these groups are where all the values are passed in and they get passed out to their correct bulbs. For example, the all group has an output connected to all of the bulbs. The left group has an output connected to the hue bloom and the, what we're calling, uh, which one is it? living room front lamp, which is the lamp that's behind it. And then the mid group is connected to the middle two lights and the right group is connected to the bedroom lamp right on its own, which is the rightmost lamp you're seeing here. And then these are what talk out to MQTT. Now I've abstracted this slightly, so we have to go into, so these are what are called subflows, so we have to go into that subflow. And this just translates values. I'll show you that in a second. But ultimately what this ends up doing is it takes the data in, which is all the settings around the brightness, the colour, all that sort of stuff as a JavaScript array, does some manipulation to it, and passes it to MQTT. And as you can see in this function here, is this where it this is where it generates the MQTT topic. So it takes Zigbee to MQTT slash this function here that gets the name of the device, the actual device name for that lamp, forward slash set. That's the MQTT topic, that gets passed out, goes into this block, and that sends the data out to MQTT and ultimately controls the light. Now this subflow thing here is a bit confusing, but the reason I've done this is because of the colour temperature adjustment. Because each of these bulbs has a different colour temperature range, but they all have the same API, where the colour temperature is specified as a value between 100 and 500. That means that even though they all, most of them have a, the, same, the same coolest temperature at 6500 Kelvin, but at the warmest temperature, they range from 2700 Kelvin down to 1800 Kelvin. And that means if you were to set it to the warmest temperature and set them all to a value of either 100 or 500, I can't remember what the coolest, the warmest is, but if you're all to set them to the warmest number, they would be different temperatures. So what I've done is I've created these subflows which work like functions that you can pull in. And I've got a different instance of it here. And within each bulb, I specify a variable for the device name, which is the MQTT name we put in the topic, the coolest temperature the bulb supports and the warmest temperature the bulb supports. So we can see for bedroom lamp right, that's 1800 Kelvin at the warmest. For the living room rear lamp, that's 2700 Kelvin at the warmest. And then the hue bloom, I think, is 2500, but only go, it doesn't go as cool. Then this function in this flow, what this does is it looks at the value of the color temperature that's been selected on the slider, and it then translates that into a value between 100 and 500 that's appropriate for the bulb. If the colour temperature is set, say, warmer than one of the bulbs can support, so it's set to, say, 2000 Kelvin, but the living room front lamp, rear lamp can only do 2700 Kelvin, it will just cap it and it will just mean that that lamp will just be a little bit cooler. It will just set all the lights that can do 2000 Kelvin to 2000 Kelvin, and the light that can only do 2700 Kelvin will just sit at 2700 Kelvin. I've probably rushed through that a lot, but that's ultimately how Node Red works. It's not the sort of thing that is super simple to pick up. You know, if you wanted to do this, you do need to put a lot of effort into thinking, just learning it. But this is so f just fun to play with and it's just so flexible. And the cool thing is that once I've got other devices that use MQTT, I can link them in here as well. I can link, say, my alarm system if I ever set that up to do MQTT. I can make that link in so when I set the alarm, it turns lights off. You could do all that just through this. It's almost like having if this, then that, but locally hosted, which is really quite cool. And even though you've got all this complexity here, it's not too hard to pick up if you're sort of reasonably technical. And ultimately it gives you, gives you this really nice dashboard that lets you control all the lights. And I just think this works really, really cool. This is just really slick. Compared to the system I built for my heating ages ago, it's not quite as nice in the sense that that had a much more customized bespoke interface designed exactly what, for what I needed it to do. Whereas this is a little bit clunky just because it's not designed necessarily for lighting, it's designed for a lot more things, but it works really well. So yeah, that's a look at what I built in Node-RED.
Now, obviously, I'm going to go into a lot more detail in future videos. I'm going to actually set up a proper system, get these set up in different rooms and actually demonstrate them working. But that was a quick taster of what I've built just as a sort of bit of a demo. So there you go. That's them all working. And the whole system works really well. What I've now done is I've now moved the Raspberry Pi into my hallway. I've got a sort of cabinet in the hall that's just good for storage. And there's a bit of a space behind that and also a network port behind that. So I've put the Pi behind there and plugged it into that network port to power it. And that keeps it hidden away out of the way. And it puts it nice and, nice and central in the flat between the living room and the bedroom where I'll have these lights. And that means I should get a good signal throughout. And yeah, we've got them all working. Obviously there's a lot more configuring I need to do in terms of like the dashboard and actually get it properly finished and then separate it between the two rooms and stuff like that. But this does just work really well. You know, I've got, I can change the colours, colours of them, I can change the modes, I can put them into more of a white colour temperature, I can set them all to white, and it works really well. As for the bulbs, I'm pretty happy with them. The only one that's not quite as good is this E27 from LED fans. It's fine, but the colours don't really seem to match the other ones as much. I find that these Muller Licht ones quite closely match the colours of the hue, whereas the colours of the LED Vance one are a little bit off. But I imagine you could probably change that in software. The whites are pretty much exactly matched, they're absolutely fine. It's just when you go into the colours, especially the blues, they tend to come out a little bit differently on this bulb compared to the others, but you could definitely have like some sort of offset in your software and convert them a little bit, so it would be okay. Other than that, they're fine. Brightness wise, they are really bright. The only thing to bear in mind is just with configurable colour temperature bulbs, they're only going to be at their absolute maximum brightness when you're in the middle of their colour temperature range, because they're mixing warm white and cool white LEDs. This is very standard though, for example the video lights I filmed this video under, they're configurable colour temperature, and they're only at their brightest in the middle temperature. That means that if I was to set this to a very cool temperature, or a very warm temperature, they're not as bright. But to be honest, when you set it to the middle temperature that's like the brightest you would really, that they go to, this is the sort of warmish white that I would normally have in a room anyway. So they're absolutely brilliantly bright at a sort of normal room type colour temperature. And then if you want them a bit warmer or a bit cooler, they aren't quite as bright, but they're still absolutely fine. The only other thing I've noticed is this, is that I think it's this one in particular does have a slight flicker to it. It's only at certain temperatures and certain colours, and I don't really notice it too much, but there is maybe a slight flicker, and you might see on camera, if I, for example, set it really warm, there's a slight rolling effect in the video. It's not too bad, like, I don't really notice it looking at it at all, it's not really bothering me, and I, I do get bothered by flickering LED lights, so it doesn't seem as bad as other ones, but it's just worth bearing in mind, but yeah, it does seem to be a bit more this LED Vance one compared to the others, the others seem a bit better in that respect. But yeah, I'm definitely very happy with them. I can now change the colour temperature, I can change the coloured scene, I can mix the colours up, and yeah, it just works really well. And the fact that this is fully self-hosted, runs totally locally in my flat, just makes me really happy, I really like it. So there we go. Thank you very much for watching. This has been a pretty epic video, I'm sure, but hopefully this is the start of many more videos like this, where I look at even more smart lights, look at smart switches, remotes, central heating stuff, sensors, all that sort of stuff. And I'll be doing this as a sort of mini-series where maybe every you know few videos I'll do another video on something like this. So yeah, thank you very much for watching, and if you're interested in buying any of this sort of stuff, there's links in the description.